Hello and welcome to Get Rich Slow, the podcast that challenges the conventional get rich quick ideology and instead explores what authentic success really means and how you can achieve it. I'm Hannah Martin, the founder of Talent Days Club, and today I'm joined by Bill Keep, Professor of Marketing and former Dean of Business and Interim Provost at the College of New Jersey for an episode on personal power. Hi, Bill, that's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. And you and I know each other um I mentioned a couple of years, haven't we? We are fellow kind of MLM researchers and uh, cam campaigners against MLM industry. Um, but we're not here to talk about MLMs today. Before we dig into what we are talking about, personal power, um, I'd just like to ask you what success means to you personally. I think success means getting to live the life you want to live. Um, and I think that's your personal life and your professional life. The trick is knowing... <laughs> what life you want to live and then getting it. And so that's kind of a two part problem there. And there are people, I guess, who are fortunate enough to know at a very young age, um, the life they want to live. Um, I think most people do not, I certainly did not. And so, so it's sort of an iterative process of learning what you want, learning how to get it, refining what you think you want, learning how to get it. Um, so uh, it takes patience that you don't really think you have in the beginning. Definitely. And I, I just want to hear that. Up. Yeah. And no, I, I was talking recently to, um, to my cousin actually about what success means. And there are people who are on paper successful who aren't living lives that actually they, they would choose to live. They maybe have a lot of money and have a, a big title. And we were talking about exactly that. Um, and it was a conversation I have often with my teenage son who's going to university and, you know, that journey. But anyway, that's a whole different topic of conversation. Um, I, before we talk about power, what's your background? So how did you get to be the uh, interim dean and provost? <laughs> how, sure. how, did you, how, what's your, how did you get to be where you are now? So I came from a working class background um, and nobody in my family went to college. And, um, you know, most of my cousins didn't go to college and um, my parents didn't go to college. Uh, and my father um, had a potato chip truck, uh, which you guys call crisps. And so he would drive his truck every day and go to local grocery stores and bars and restaurants and petrol stations and sell them potato chips. And he would make a commission on that. <clears throat> And the funny thing is, my father had had polio when he was a teenager, so he walked with a limp, and he climbed in and out of that potato chip truck many, many dozens of times every day for 30 years, and he liked his job. And so I was, growing up as a young man, I hated working on his potato chip truck, but I had a dad who liked his job, even though he didn't make a lot of money. And so, you know, that's a really powerful kind of thing. Um but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So when I got out of high school when I was 17, I didn't have any money for college. My parents certainly didn't have any money. So I joined the US Coast Guard. Um, and there they taught me how to repair radios and radars and things like that, electronics technician. And then um, it was a four year commitment. And my two years in, I married my girlfriend. So I got married when I was 19. Um, and then I got out at 21. I had no idea what I was doing. And I worked in a factory and I became a postal worker and um, my wife worked some. And um, finally, when I was 23, I went to university. Um, it took me five years to get my first degree. Uh, we had a, a son. Um, I, uh, I was 28 when I got my first degree um, and I had no job when I graduated. Um, and so um, I started working. Uh, for the next five years in various jobs in business, actually. And I found business to be interesting. Um, and by now, um, I'm, I'm a father with, uh, with two children and um, had been married for a while, still didn't have very much money, um, and I'm not very happy with my career. Again, that iterative process of, you know, I uh, had a nice home life, but no money and not much of a future. And when I was in college, I was impressed by what professors did. I thought, you know, when you get a good professor, it's a fascinating process and how they get people engaged in, in the material. So I, my wife and I talked and I convinced her that I 
should go get a go get a PhD, become a professor. And um, so she started working full time to help me do that. Um, our kids were four and nine. Uh, it took us five years. And so um, when I was just past 29, I got my PhD. And um, so now um, here I'm 69 and um, I've spent, um, uh, uh, sorry, let me back up. Well, I just passed 39. Sorry. I was going to say, I, I was totally, uh, my math isn't great on the hoof. So I, <laughs> yeah. right. well, I, I, I went into the program when I, I, 33, almost 34. And I got my PhD when I was 39. And so um, here I am 30 years now, um, being a professor, a dean, et cetera. And I can tell you that once I understood some of my strengths and my interest and in, in what I wanted my life to be, these 30 years have been unbelievably satisfying. Um, you know, not rich, never thought I'd be rich, never really worried too much about being rich. Don't like not having any money. That's not that's not a good feeling, um, and we we had that feeling. We were month to month for quite a few years, um, but um, having a job that you get up to every day, literally every day, and you look forward to it, um, and you try to think of how to do it better, um, and um, and then it continued to evolve. I wanted to be a. a once I saw what administrators did and I saw that some of them doing it poorly, I thought I could do that. So then I became a dean. <laughs> so that's sort of the path. And now I'm almost at the end of my career. I, I always want to, I sort of challenge you on something and clarify. You say you're not rich. And, and I think financially, maybe you, you're not a millionaire, but I think riches in, uh, has many forms. And to me, uh, going back to what successfully means, I would say you're rich. As long as, can you pay your bills? Can you afford the things that you, that you want in life? Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I have two grown sons who, you know, respect me and love me and my wife and respect her and respect each other. And I have a daughter-in-law and a grandson. And um, so we um, enjoy being with each other when we can. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, I celebrate 50 years married uh, um, this month. It's Jai. <laughs> And, and just I remember to get a present and card. <laughs> Don't forget yeah, the date. Yeah, just a few weeks. <laughs> uh, July 22nd. Uh, we'll be married 50 years. Uh, and, you know, clearly everybody would like to have a little more money in their retirement fund, of course. Um, but um, I'm fine. And we're fine. And we're happy where we are. We're healthy. Um, and, um, you know, it, it is a difficult process. And, and, and what I think about sometimes are people who go down those paths because most people aren't born knowing what they want and most people don't have a ton of resources. <clears throat> but it's tenuous, right? In other words, a car accident, an illness, a sick child can shift you, your energies, your money, your attention in ways that can make it difficult and you have to kind of come back from that. So there, there are random things that happen in our lives that we can't control um, that still impact us. We can control how we react and how we move forward, um, but life is filled with challenges. Absolutely. And, I, and I, 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 I'm really glad that you talked about your background because it perfectly leads us into the topic we're talking about today, which is power, because I think you have demonstrated the choices you've made and how you lived your life, a good demonstration of power used properly and taking pride in your own life. So to lead us into that, can you explain what power means? Sure. I think of power as the ability to control what happens to you. Uh, and I think, you know, you can have more power or less power, um, but uh, the ability uh, to not be constantly buffeted by what's happening to you in your environment. Um, when you are in that situation, you have no power. Um, it's an awful feeling. Um, and um, so power means you can control some of that. Um, and therefore, you are both protected and you have the ability to shape things. 
And so you have choices. You've, you've created an environment where you have choices. So you're not always feeling as if you're simply um, the victim of somebody else's decisions. And I like it. This is a choice, the choice of words there, you know, so in fact that things, as you mentioned just earlier, things can happen to us and we can't always control that. But power is about taking control back for yourself, how, making choices for yourself, even when it, something might take them away. But we misunderstand or we, we misuse the term power quite often. Don't we? we think of power as a Trump-esque kind of an abuse of power, but, you know, it's someone who holds a position of power. So we don't really understand Power and, and, and think about language. I often hear people talk about being powerless. You know, we will say, oh, I was powerless in that situation. But we never really hear people say, I was powerful. So we often talk about an absence of power personally, but we don't talk about having power. So it, it, why is power misunderstood? Why is it such a, a, a topic that people don't really understand? Well, I, I really like the way you've described that um, because, um, first of all, power is everywhere. Uh, power is the most obvious things we see in the news and people who in high elected positions are, are very wealthy people who run big corporations or, or people who are, are in other kinds of positions of power, the Pope, um, people who have, by designation of their role, a tremendous amount of power. Um, and, and then there is, um, you know, power in, in the community. There's power. There's petty power in the workplace where somebody has a little power over six people or things like that. Um, so uh, the power is everywhere. One of the things that I think that is very interesting, and I think uh, I can speak more, I guess, from Western culture than, than Eastern culture or uh, others. Um, but, you know, Western culture, uh, and I think this is true to some extent in lots of other cultures, though, there was dec uh, centuries of the powerful, the few powerful and the many powerless, right? Um, you saw it, of course, in, in centuries and centuries of kings, and we've seen it in, in other areas. And, and, and so it's funny that people who c come from the position of powerless sometimes feel even embarrassed about wanting power or having power. Um, there's uh, a sense of of not that not being right or that being ambitious to have power um, is wrong. Um, it's something you know. I know you in your culture you use the word posh. Um, you know, uh, it's something that our, co our our friends and family would look down upon. Ambition, um, the pursuit of power. Um, who do you think you are? Who do you think you want to be? Right? Um, and so I, I think that the, the culture plays a, a big role in how we think about power or not think about it and how we don't talk about it. Um, even though we feel it, we feel it in the workplace, we feel it in some social relationships, we see it in, in the politics from the local community politics to the national politics to global politics. Um, and so we see it, it seems distant to us uh, at times, but we don't necessarily embrace it. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I think that we, we confuse power with the abuse of power um, or um, some sort of power associated with some sort of social strata system, and we're simply not in that class, so to speak. Um, Absolutely. It, it sort of connects to status, isn't it? So you have high status equals power and low status equals no power. And I absolutely agree with you. If you look at medieval England and, and, and how that was, was constructed, the, you know, there were few people with a lot of power and many people with virtually no power. But, but actually, Today, things are very different, but we still, there is that, that sort of idea, you're, you're born to a, to a right to power, or, or some people have a personality that maybe other people think, well, they, they, they are more maybe outgoing, they're more dominant, so therefore they are more powerful. And what we don't understand is that personal responsibility where we all have, 
we all have power in small ways you know even in our own house we have power to decide you know like if i'm going to cook tea for my children what time am i going to cook tea for them what i'm going to cook for them there's a there's a, there's a sense of power there isn't there so we, we we tend to see power as quite absolute and quite status driven which is uh, we overlook actually the real meaning of power do you think oh i think that's right you mentioned having um a, a son in college when our children are teenagers, I think that's one of the most obvious times when we are seen by somebody else as having tremendous power. We say to our teenagers, you have to be in by 10. I, I, I don't like you hanging around with those friends. I'd like to know what you're doing or those things. For the first time, when they were in middle school, you know, maybe they didn't like it a lot, but they kind of accepted it. But as teenagers, they look at us like, who are you to tell me, right? And so it's, the, for me, anyhow, that's the first um, experience for me where at a personal level where you're, here's someone you love and you know, and they, they look at you like, why are you exercising this power over me? And you're like, I, don't know, I just thought I was being a good dad or a good mom, right? Uh, so you're absolutely right. And uh, I think that the social issue is huge. Um, and, and, and I think particularly now, um, in the last, in the United States, in the last uh, 40 years, since the 1980s, let's say, um, there's been a steady decline in the middle class. Um, and so we've seen increased um, in, um uh, uneven income distribution, right? A lot more uneven uh, than it had been for many, many, many decades. Um, and for those people uh, who grew up in families that in a way took the future for granted, you know, I, I assume my kids will have lives like I had or whatever, or maybe better. And now we're in uh, a time when um, that presumption is shattered um, and it makes people feel even more powerless. Uh, and, and then we throw into that, you know, an economy where jobs are changing um, and, you know, in non in complete nonsense, like, the gig economy, we're all going to go and own our own business and go out and work as independent entrepreneurs. That's complete nonsense. It's a salve for people who don't want to talk about the underlying problems. Um, so the, but having said that, there's still paths for personal power and for professional power. You have to first accept that that's true. Because if you don't think that's true, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. So how can, how can people, um, what can they do to, to see power differently? Like what kind of reframes they need to make regarding that? Like if someone's listening to this and thinking, I, I can kind of, I, can, I, I get this, it, it's appealing to me, but I'm not really sure what I change or how I look at it differently. What can you say right. to them? Well, I think that for me, um, the most constructive way to think of power is to think of it as a tool. Um, if you don't have the tool, you can't do certain things. Uh, if you have the tool, you can. You can misuse the tool, right? You know, uh, so uh, people have used misused tools in all kinds of ways. Um, and uh, uh, power can be a particularly... Um, difficult uh, when it's used wrong, when it's misused. But if we accept the fact that the power is a tool, then why not have that tool for you, right? Why not understand that it can help you fix problems, it can help you get things you want, and it does not have to be abused. You do not have to be abusive if you have power. Um, I once left a job, and my assistant said to me, 
she was crying and she said to me, I know I'm never going to have a better boss than you. And I thought that's one of the best compliments I've ever had from somebody who worked for me because I felt like I treated her with respect. We didn't always, I mean, we had our differences, of course. And um, uh, so, uh, but over the years we worked together, you know, we, we learned how to work with each other. I was the boss. Mm -hmm. She knew I was the boss. Um, but nonetheless, um, I respected what she did. I respected the effort she put in and, and we got along really well. Um, so I think that people have to accept the fact that power can be an empowering tool and, and, and it's nothing to be ashamed of to want it. It's mm -hmm. nothing to be ashamed of to have it. And in fact, when we see somebody in power who acts responsibly, it's impressive. And I think that, that that's a really important point. They, they, you know, they say, isn't it, with great power comes great responsibility. But I would say with any power comes responsibility. Because even, even the power, we have small children. As a parent, we have an enormous amount of power. But we have to make sure that, that, that we, we, we do that, treat them properly. Um, what I would say is, do you think women struggle with the idea of power more than men? Oh, definitely. Um, and I think that um, it's... This is just my, I'm not a, a, a gender studies person, um, but I think there's a couple of factors that contribute to that. The first and most obvious one to me is that um, although I wouldn't want to, you know, reinforce too many gender stereotypes, I, I think that one of the stereotypes that sticks with me is that women tend to be more nurturing by nature. Um, and I think that um, is a giving kind of um, um, tendency, a tendency to take care of something, a tendency to set something right, you know, in the environment or wherever. And I think that that, um, that is obviously uh, not just a needed thing in our society and in our home lives. It's critical. Um, it's critical to our happiness. Um, uh, but I do think that it, it um, then can cause women to um, be less assertive, um, worry a bit too much about uh, uh, how this might impact everybody else. Uh, not that we shouldn't think about that. We definitely do. But uh, um, men do think about that, too, but they don't think about it like women do. Hmm. Um, but do you think it, it's, it's my, really interesting? My, my you talk about about that, and I think about you know the, the nurturing role that women are, are, tend to have more, more more of a nurturing instinct. That actually, so we tend to think that nurturing and power are therefore incompatible, isn't it? There's a sense that you can't be a nurturer and you can't be, and you're powerful. And you know, and they keep going back to sort of you know as a mother the power that you have in the home. But I think actually you talked about being a good boss, and I'm sure part of what made you a good boss was nurturing the strengths and the happiness of your employee or the person who works sure. for you. So, so, so actually power doesn't have to, it can, it, it can, it should coexist surely with nurture. And, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm saying that, like that, I'm not saying that, that I agree with you with everything you said. And like, what I'm saying is that maybe this can help women. Maybe they need to see that it's okay to be nurturing. And powerful isn't this masculine status driven, energy that power has many forms so power can coexist with being feminine and nurturing if you want it to oh i think that's exactly right i think in fact if we think of power as increasing the impact you have you can actually increase the nurturing impact you have and even if we put that in a business environment right um i think that um you know we're when we nurture our employees when we encourage them to do further training, when we make sure that if something crisis comes up in their family, we're supportive. When we nurture our employees, we get it back. Um, we get it back in lots of ways. And so the, um, uh, that tendency to nurture that comes so strongly, I think, in women actually is a plus for them. But they have to be willing to recognize and take on this notion that power um, is... Uh, going to allow them to do have a greater impact 
right? But it also means that um, the decisions that you make sometimes when you have power um, may feel like not nurturing. And you have to balance that off. Say, for example, um, I have had to not re, um, renew uh, people's contracts before. And they were going to be out of a job at the end of that contract. And I've done that a few times. Right? And clearly, that had an impact on their families. Right? Um, now, um, I did it because I thought it was best for the organization um, I thought um, uh, we were really not going to be able to achieve some of the things we wanted to achieve um, uh, with this person in this position, or maybe even the position itself was the wrong position. And uh, so my job was to think about the organization and where it would be five years from now. Um, and uh, this is clearly a mismatch between this person um, and um, that the role they were playing with the organization, but you can't deny the fact that you just put this person out of work. It's real, right? And, you know, I've had people go up on Facebook and <laughs> say bad things about me because of that. <laughs> but but it, it, it comes down to, you know, we took up power, personal power again. It's like, and you talked about circumstances earlier on that happened to us. And I, I know that you recommended a very good book on power by Jeffrey Pfeffer, is it? Um, which is excellent. And, and he talks there about re resilience and the importance of power in times of resilience, because we're all going to have times where we might be laid off or, or decisions are made that we do not want to be made that affect us. But then we, we can have those moments straight away and go, you know, how can Bill do that? I hate Bill. That's really wrong. And then we have to kind of bounce back and go, okay, well, it's reality. And maybe he had his reasons and maybe I don't understand, but I'm going to make that better for me. I, I remember years ago, I got, um, I'd say illegally sacked for being a mother from my job and, and I was I was the, the provider between of my family. I had a very young baby and, and I and I had a big mortgage and I was didn't know what I was going to do. It came out of the blue and it emotionally floored me, financially floored me. Within two days I was freelancing and less than a month later I had a job that was on more money and a better company. And I think it, it's that sort of be you know and I and I was determined that that was not going to define me and I was going to be better off as a result of it. But that wasn't something that happened to me out of luck. It happened to me because I took my power in that situation, that I, I took control um, and made decisions that helped me. So I think we all have personal responsibility. And going back to that nurturing decisions you make, it, it, is, it is not using power correctly. If you take, for example, you kept those people on because you felt sorry for them. And then they weren't doing a job that was right for them. The organization would suffer. So ultimately, it, it was the right thing to do. And it was their responsibility to therefore use their power to, to, to deal with that situation. Yeah, I think that one of the issues that kind of trips us up sometimes is this notion of fairness. <coughs> Excuse me. So I should just say now that Bill is recovering from COVID as we speak. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's the coughing. We, we have this sense of, um, well, that, <coughs> that's not fair. <coughs> Excuse me again. <coughs> so the, um, the, our sense of fairness is something that comes from us over a long period of time from when we were very young, growing up, you know, how things get ad, 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 adjudicated in our lives. Um, and so, you know, whether it's what we're taught about sharing with other children or all kinds of things that sort of develop this sense of fairness, the, the world is filled with people who are making decisions that impact us. Some of these decisions don't even know who we are. Some of these people making these decisions don't even know who we are, but they are making decisions that impact us. And so almost by definition, Life is filled with unfairness. And so if we spend too much time worrying about that, um, it will, it will it, it trip us up as we're trying to move forward. Um, if anything, power allows you to be more fair. Power allows you to take the things that you have learned and understood about fairness, about uh, helping people p 
treating people both accountably, responsibly, and rewarding them appropriately, whether that's financial reward or it's, you know, you know, when our teenagers are growing up, if they act responsibly, we give them more, more privilege, more, more leeway. So, so, you know, this notion of, of power and unfairness, these things um, actually can complement each other. We actually can use power to, to make a more fair work environment, um, more fair in our, in our relationships with each other. Um, and, uh, but we, but it is a responsibility. Um, and you will inevitably find people that, um, will see what we did as unfair. Um, either they have a different standard of fairness or in some cases they simply don't have all the information. They just saw one part of it and like, well, that's not fair. Um, I also want to mention the second part of, of, of why I think women um, have a difficult time embracing uh, the pursuit of power. And that is that um, for thousands of years, uh, they were discouraged from doing so. It's just that simple. Um, you know, societies have been male dominant for, man, a long, long time. You know, there are matriarchal society examples here and there, and I'm sure we could find some anthropologists that could give us some examples. But by and large, um, men have made the decisions, men have controlled the resources. Um, and, you know, you talked about the Middle Ages. Even women in the aristocracy in the Middle Ages, they were just traded. You know, you would marry your daughter off for some political alliance or whatever, whatever. This wasn't, they had no power, right? You know, some, maybe some clever woman behind the scenes was able to manipulate a king or whatever, whatever. But those are rare examples. Uh, there are definitely examples out there. Catherine the Great in Russia was a, a, a well, big example of a female leader there, et cetera. But most women, most of the time, for most of history, have been discouraged from pursuing or using power. And I have to just say, I my first husband was from one of the few matrilineal cultures. It's a, a min and cabal in West Sumatra, and women inherit the land and, and and the money, and 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 men actually travel because they they can't. It's it's, it's a lot of it's farmland, and they're they're farming land they're never going to own. And yet the men still make good decisions. The women still do all the housework and the child rearing, and it's a, a matrilineal culture but it's still male dominated. So I absolutely agree with you. Um, I just want to come yeah. back to something about um, talking about then about um, how, and again, like worrying about other people when we make decisions. And I think there are always going to be people, however you make a decision, someone is not going to like it. They're, they're not going to understand, as you said, they're not going to see the full picture of decision making. And I think one of the things that, that again, it comes back to kind of personal power, when we're making decisions, we have to trust that, the, the, the information we have and make a decision based on that that's right rather than and then again this agreeableness comes in where maybe like women really struggle with that more than men a decision that's going to be unpopular or going to hurt somebody because i think when you, when we incorporate those things that are out of our control and influence us we give part of our power away don't we we're not making the best decision for the situation for us we're giving some of our power right. to, to something outside of us i think that's right i think that that along with recognizing that power can be a useful and positive tool and is something that it is worth um, uh, pursuing um, and using responsibly. Um, the other issue here is um, who's responsible for the life you want to live, right? I mean, if, if success is getting to live the life you want to live, who's responsible for that? Um, and I think that um, there actually can only be one answer, um, and it has to be you. Um, and I don't think that, um, and this is true of, of men as well as women, but mo more, I think, more of them. I don't think that's always encouraged. And I think that we risk sometimes in cultures of raising children who think that somehow something's going to take care of them. I don't know what it is, but, you know, I mean, Literally, the best thing that happened to me was to leave home when I was 17 and to never ask my mom and dad for money again. 
that's really a great thing that happened to me, even though I had no idea what I was doing and I didn't always make the best choices, <laughs> but you know, we, we, we need to be careful, um, uh, how we talk to our young people and, um, you know, you know, often in relationships, for example, um, you know, and my wife and I have a very, you know, kind of traditional and not traditional in the sense that she does all the, the cooking and, and the laundry and the shopping. And, you know, we try to split the cleaning and, but, and, but in the course of our relationship, we've had every combination. I've worked full-time. She hasn't, she's worked full-time. I haven't, we've worked both part-time. We've had every combination. And whenever we, we had young, really young ones, the priority was for her to be home, be home with the young ones for a few years. And we did everything, I did everything I could so that she could be home. But then when I wanted to go to graduate school, even though we had two kids, she went to work full time. So that sort of cross support, um, but she had to be responsible and speak up when something was important to her, like being home with the young ones. And I spoke up when something was important to me. The reality is that I was much more inclined to speak up than her. She was less inclined. I mean, we worked it out. Um, you know, I obviously could see when she was unhappy and we had to talk about that. Um, but, you know, success isn't something someone gives us. Um, and so, you know, we have to um, know that. And, and we have to know that life is filled with compromises. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, Absolutely. Um, you know, so, and it has definitely strengthened our relationship, the compromises we've made with each other. So I, I, by the way, I, it's like, uh, it has like a, the air con come on or something. Oh, I'm sorry. It did. Is it loud? Okay, it's, no, no, it's okay. It just sounds like on an airplane. It's, it's fine. It's fine. I was just curious. Um, I, I, I like to give people practical tips. So thinking about power. So, um, how can, and I, and I think like maybe it, it comes down to actually the acknowledgement that you can choose and have it, but so how can someone start to have more power over their life? I think two things. First of all, watch. Watch and think of the world in terms of power. Watch what people do and say. Watch the language they use, right? And so when you do that, you begin to recognize sources of power, who has power. When you're inside of an organization, watch who gets promoted and who doesn't. Uh, watch how decisions get made. Um, and watching with the lens that you're looking for how power expresses itself and how people have power can be very informative, really helpful. And it, you're not doing anything. You're just learning and you're just observing. Um, and, um, and that even means the examples of where people have power and they do incredibly great things with that power or generous things. Um, so the second thing is that you have to be willing to know that this is your life and um, you are entitled to pursue power that helps you have the life you want. And the first thing you need to do is get a little bit uncomfortable, right? I'm not, I'm not saying get completely out of your comfort zone or anything, but you know, when, you recognize there's something that fits in your notion of how you want to live your life, helps you be success, you know, pursue success and happiness. Take some steps towards it. And, and that means it could mean something as simple of, uh, you know, um, documenting, uh, some of the things you've done and having a conversation um, with someone at work about um, where your career is going. Um, or um, it could be something as, as simple as 
uh, going to um, social or professional events to meet people in the industry that you're in or that you want to be in and learning and listening um, and getting a plan together so that you can make the jump to that job you want, right? Um, when you do that and it works, it's really encouraging. You really feel like, wow, right? I can do that. I mean, nobody told me to, what to do. I sat there and listened and I observed and I heard what people were talking about and I saw a couple of opportunities. And the interesting thing is, from an employment perspective, you can do all of that and no one has to know. If someone ever says to you, are you job searching? Well, you know, I'm just trying to learn a lot more about the industry, right? It's it. And then when you're ready, when you're ready, while you still have the job you have, when you're ready, you can go out and, and have that short list of companies or positions you're looking for um, and go for them. Um, and I think that that builds confidence. And if there's one thing that will help you in pursuing success, it's confidence, right? So confidence helps you uh, uh, take that next chance. And the nice thing about confidence is as you achieve confidence, setbacks aren't a big deal anymore, right? Because once you've had a few successes, it doesn't take too many. It's like, oh, that didn't work out, right? Um, and so, but it's not, it doesn't trash you emotionally mm -hmm. because you know that inside of you, you know, okay, you know, people have stuff that's all the time, right? Um, and and so, you know, I think that, you know, that notion that that, that these Dismissing these these issues of fair and unfairness, dismissing these issues of, of coming from a, so, a certain social status that makes you uncomfortable um, in another social status, dismissing these issues that you're a woman and not a man uh, has factors that, that um, prevent you from pursuing the power you need to create the choices that will give you the kind of success in life that you want to give. Um, and, you know, there's a term that's, that you, you, I'm sure you've heard of. It's called imposter syndrome. It's where people achieve a level of success that they didn't, um, that, 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 that they were not, in a sense, um, prepared for or trained for or culturally um, fit. Um, and so they're, they've moved up the They've had social mobility, and they've moved up the social ladder. And so there's a sense of, of, you know, do I really belong here? You know, well, heck, yes, you do. <laughs> you belong there. You know, you worked hard. You made some good choices. You know, you overcame some, some uh, setbacks, uh, and you definitely belong there. And I think that, that that imposter syndrome is probably a little more common in women in certain career paths, you know, um, where they were dominated by men for so long. Um, and I think that, you know, I worry that we're in a culture now where, uh, uh, or in a, an environment now where um, uh, people are particularly mean to people. Um, and we see it in the United States all the time. Unfortunately, we have all other kinds of problems in the United States. Um, but um, as far as I know, you only have one life. And so um, let's use power, let's be smart, let's observe, um, let's see how other people do things, um, and let's be really responsible with it. There are people who have used power in awful, awful ways, right? And in some cases to enrich themselves, in some cases uh, just because they could, which is a terrible thing, right? I mean. Bill Clinton famously said that he had his relationship with Monica Lewinsky for the worst reason, because he could. That's just pure power. It's just, I get to do this. And that's awful, right? Um, 
But when you see thoughtful use of power, uh, people have built successful companies, people have made wonderful public policy decisions, um, uh, people have uh, improved their communities, their churches, et cetera, um, because they use power. Perfect. Thank you. That is a really um, fitting, nice note to end things on. Um, thank you so much. It's such an interesting topic. Um, I could talk to you for much longer but, um, about it, but um, can you just uh, say if people want to find out more about you or connect with you, how can they do that? Oh, sure. Um, uh, my email is just keep. You see my last name here on the screen. Um, which is a, a British last name. Uh, my email is keep uh, at TCNJ, uh, which is the institution I'm at, dot edu. Um, happy to respond to any inquiries. Um, uh, I would encourage people to take a look at um, the book uh, Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't by Jeffrey Pfeffer. Uh, I think it's an a interesting book. Uh, there you go. Um, you know, he doesn't have all the answers there, but he has a lot of data there. And, um, you know, we should not be embarrassed by the fact that we want the life we want. And it doesn't mean you have to trash other people to get it. Um, so, and at the same time, you can't res be responsible for everybody else's happiness. That will work, right? Absolutely. So finding, that, finding that middle ground where you can be successful, help other people, be, be responsible and accountable, um, is very enriching. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bill. That was really interesting. And I, I certainly learned a lot from that. No, I appreciate you having me on.